Adolf Hitler was born on April 20th, 1889 in Austria. He was the fourth of six children to Aloy Hitler and Clara Pulzel. When he was three years old, his family moved to Germany. Adolf sang in the church choir and even became a priest. At a young age, Hitler developed German nationalist ideals. After Adolf's father's sudden death in 1903, Adolf's performance in school deteriorated and he left his technical school for an art school. He was rejected from the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts. By 1907, his mother had died and he ran out of money and he began living in homeless shelters. When World War I broke out, Adolf volunteered to serve in the Bavarian army. Hitler described the war as the greatest of all experiences and was praised by his commanding officers for his bravery. After World War I, Hitler went to Munich and became involved in politics. He became a member of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party, and designed their logo, the swastika. Hitler went on to become very popular with his ideas and speeches. He gained many followers for the Nazi Party. He had a strong ability to present his ideas in a very influential way. In 1923, Hitler and the Nazi party attempted to take over the government, but he was arrested for high treason and served a year in a prison. After his release from prison, Hitler continued to try and increase the political power of the Nazi party. Hitler amended the German constitution and helped pass laws that would make him the Führer, or leader and chancellor, once the current chancellor died. Further, he continued to pass laws that would make it legally impossible for him to be removed from office. At this point, he was ready to begin his horrible agenda. World War II began because Hitler was seeking more and more power in Europe. He controlled Germany and he now wanted to control more countries. Hitler had plans to take over Europe and create a perfect society. Part of his plan was eliminating people of Jewish and Slavic descent. This began the Holocaust. German soldiers scoured Europe for Jews and Slavs and had them put into concentration camps where they were worked as slaves and eventually killed in many terrible, inhumane ways. During the Holocaust, 11 million people were murdered. By 1945, World War II had ended. Hitler married his longtime companion, Eva Braun, and then the next day they both committed suicide together. In later years, it was reported that Hitler suffered from many ailments such as irritable bowel syndrome, Parkinson's disease, and borderline personality disorder. He also became addicted to amphetamine drugs, and some link this to his erratic decisions and behavior. So that's a little, little uh, biography, of course, on Adolf Hitler. It's actually today's birthday, believe it or not. I think he's 132, uh, believe it or not. Uh, so anyway, I want to welcome you back, of course, to History 1123. Uh, this is Daniel Simon, of course, at Baton Rouge Community College. I uh, hope everybody's having another great week, of course. Uh, of course, we are, of course, almost wrapping up the semester. I think we got this week and next week that's pretty much left uh, to go. Uh, and... Um, before I get started, looks like we do have a few students watching right now. I think Amber's watching, of course, looks like it. Hey, what's going on? You're doing great out there uh, this morning. Uh, also, uh, jo uh, it looks like uh, David and Christina are also watching. And, of course, it looks like Savannah's also watching this morning. Anyone else watching, let me know, of course, later if you're out there watching this live stream right now. Uh, so uh, anyway, yeah, uh, of course, today, yeah, I'll be moving on. Yeah, we're, we're talking about between the world wars. Uh, of course, I'll get into uh, and talk about mostly the rise of fascism, which occurs with like Mussolini and Hitler, et cetera, uh, that you've got. So I'll get into that and might even start talking about close to getting to World War II today uh, also as well. So uh, anyway, yeah, I do got a lot of assignments out there right now. I know the current ones we've got now. Uh, or the ones we've already talked about before, like the Industrial Revolution, you know, Canvas Quiz is still out, which will be due later in the week. Uh, book reports were also already due last weekend on that third vocab. If you didn't turn that in yet, you know, get those to me. Uh, there is a new quiz I posted this morning. You'll, you'll see an announcement about it on Canvas, but I have one more final quiz I'm going to give you uh, in the semester, uh, which will be on World War I the War One era, that's pretty much it for the semester. Uh, and then after that, you know, uh, I think whatever left, I think from fascism up to whatever I get to next week, uh, will be pretty much on the final exam. Hey, Hope, what's going on this morning? 
Uh, so, so some of you might not have to take the final, you know, because, you know, anybody has a really good grade. It is an A plus in my classes. Uh, you are exempt from the final, uh, except, you know, uh, you do have to finish all your other assignments that are still out there. Quizzes, you know, vocab and whatever's left. There should be a final vocab I've posted already uh, as well. So anyway, like I said today, I'm going to talk about what we call the post-World War I era, uh, mostly in Europe I'll get to, uh, which, uh, you know, that so-called between the wars, world wars that they have, which is not a good period, you know, because they have like the economic dep Great Depression that happens, you know, a lot throughout the world, uh, which leads into that. And, of course, you've got the rise of fascism that comes in <clears throat> that really, of course, you know, causes that uh, to occur. You also have fascism, you know, rise in Asia, like with Japan, the Empire of Japan, which, you know, gets the United States involved uh, in World War II. So, yeah, if anybody has any comments, questions, of course, during the live stream, or you can, you know, like I said, always send me, you know, comments, questions, of course, about the lecture later, uh, you know, throughout the semester and anything else before that, you know, you got questions from previously from other lectures, just let me know. All right. So uh, anyway, uh, of course, I'll continue, like I said, talking about between the wars. Uh, they have this uh, state that kind of forms after World War I kind of ends uh, in what is Germany, uh, which is called the Weimar Republic that they have. So I'll kind of blow up here. And it's kind of this uh, unofficial nickname that they call the period in uh, Germany. Uh, from like around after World War I uh, to about 1933, uh, when the Nazis seized power under Hitler. It was named for uh, Weimar, a city in Germany, where they formed like the Constitution of Germany at the time. Uh, and um, it was basically, uh, it really starts in 1919 is when it really starts, because I think it's when they ratified the Constitution. Uh, and they believe it was a type of state that formed uh, because of what they call the German Revolution that broke out. Which happened, I think it started in November of 1918. It went into 1919, like the spring of 1919. What happened was in Germany, they overthrew the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II, who went into um, exile, I think with the, the Netherlands. And what happened was they created this uh, liberal democratic republic uh, afterwards, uh, which was mostly founded by uh, social democrats. And they were the ones that created, which were social, like moderate socialists that were there. And it was a type of constitution, by the way, that had direct uh, representation where they gave like voting rights uh, to men, but also women, like women had a right to vote too uh, in Germany afterwards. Uh, and, um, under this government, uh, they had two heads of state. Like they got rid of the Kaiser, which was, you know, a monarch, and they had two heads of state, which was they had a president of Germany that they had, uh, and then they had a chancellor, which they call it, like a prime minister, uh, which they had before. And um, so you had two heads of state. Uh, the uh, president of Germany was more like a, a ceremonial position, uh, and then the chancellor was like the head of the government. You know, like Hitler would be chancellor later. 1933. Uh, also, it had this constitution where they had a bicameral parliament of Germany, which had two houses. One you may have heard of called the Reichstag, uh, which was like the called the lower house. And they had one called the, uh, the Reichsrat, which was the upper house. And it was kind of comparable to uh, the uh, British parliament, uh, where you have like a house of lords uh, and a house of commons. Uh, and so I think the upper one was supposed to be like the House of Lords and the lower one was supposed to be like the House of Commons, kind of like that uh, is what kind of was. Sometimes they just call it the Reichstag because they met in this building called the Reichstag Building, which is in Berlin. Uh, and so hence that name is often used throughout the period, even up to like the Nazi Germany. Uh, they had different presidents of uh, Germany during that time period, at least through the Weimar uh, they had like uh, Frederick Ebert was one of the first who came to power, uh, who was elected uh, in 1919 uh, and uh, was in power till he died in 1925. And then uh, Paul von Hindenburg, who was a famous veteran uh, general of World War I on the German side, uh, he, of course, uh, <clears throat> was uh, also, uh, you can see, 
president from 1925 to 1934. He died in power too as well. And then Hitler took over later. Uh, Hitler is really the third president who comes in later. Uh, but he's going to merge the chancellorship with basically the presidency, which will be called the Fuhrer, which they were talking about in the video. Yeah, here's right here. I'll put it on the screen. But he's Fuhrer from 1934 to 1945, which Fuhrer is a, a title that meant leader, uh, which was kind of comparable to what Mussolini had in Italy, which was the Il Duce, which meant the same thing, I think, sort of. Uh, and so it's kind of, kind of, Hitler kind of modeled himself after kind of Mussolini a little bit. Uh, he's kind of compared the two. <clears throat> uh, the Weimar, by the way, struggled. That's one thing about it. It didn't do well uh, between like World War I and the 1930s. Uh, there was like different reasons for it, but uh, the two common things was that they suffered through like a post-war depression where there was a lot of uh, economic problems. Uh, they also had the Great Depression later too <clears throat> as well. Then they had to pay all these war debts they had too, uh, which you can see numbered as much as like <clears throat> 70, 72 million that they had. Anyway, um, so yeah, so the Weimar, you can see there, you can see, by the way, uh, Hindenburg, which is on the left right there in that picture, um, that was part of the problem. It, it created massive inflation uh, throughout Germany where uh, they, they started printing a lot of money. I, I don't know if you ever seen images of how uh, when the hyperinflation period, they started printing all these so-called million-dollar marks uh, where you had like a, almost like a million-dollar bill. Uh, like we would have, uh, and uh, it was like worthless, wasn't worth any money. Uh, and so like I think 1923 to about 1924, uh, they suffered through a period with really, really bad hyperinflation uh, in the country. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, wood uh, was actually uh, more, was actually more expensive than paper or something like that. Uh, they could actually, you know, take wood or whatever and, you know, but um Here's people wearing this stuff. It's not worth worth anything. So if you wanted to go buy something like at, I guess, like the store or whatever, it would take almost like a wheelbarrow full of money uh, to actually buy stuff. You actually see the kids stacking up the money in that middle picture right there, which is ridiculous. Or people put it on their wall, like, you know, wallpaper or something like that. So, so yeah, that, that had a lot to do with it. Um, you know, why the, the Weimar, you know, would, would eventually fail, you know, uh, but also you can throw in too, you know, the, you know, besides that, like failures of democracy, I think they kind of throw that in there too, also, which I guess didn't work at that time for some reason. And so people started to look more towards uh, totalitarian fascism, uh, which becomes really, really popular. In a lot of countries in Europe, Germany, uh, Italy, Spain, uh, Etc. And part of it was also done to deter, you know, communism. There, there, was, there was this fear throughout Europe and other countries uh, that communism was going to take over. Uh, and so that was the reason why people began to embrace fascism. Uh, so you get the, you know, the rise of these fascist dictators like Benito Mussolini uh, that you're looking at right there. Uh, and, um, like the fascist states, like I'll kind of give you a definition. I'll put it on the screen here, but here's a kind of a definition of what fascism really is. It's it's a right wing political ideology. It's kind of considered. I guess they usually term use the term far right. I think is what they dub it. But it embraced a lot, a lot, <clears throat> a lot of things like extreme nationalism. Is one thing, of course, they were known for. They wanted to revitalize the economy. Uh, they wanted to beef up the military. Uh, a lot of the, the dictators dress like in military style uniforms, which Hitler and Mussolini would do. Francisco Franco also did it uh, as well. Uh, and they tend, tended to squash things like democracy. You don't have democracy as much. Uh, they limit civil civil liberties. Uh, they have a lot of secret polices that watch the population. So it's like a police state uh, the way it is. Uh, so constantly spying on people. You have people that spy on you. Like you tell somebody something about like you hate Hitler or something like that. And they tell, 
tell on you, of course. And of course, you end up getting in big trouble. Uh, the Nazis, you know, uh, hated various racial groups like the Jews, the Slavs, thought they were inferior, uh, thought they should be eliminated uh, and things like that. Uh, there's different kinds of fascist dictators that were in Europe. Uh, of course, you see Mussolini, of course, in Italy was probably one of the first uh, you hear about uh, as well. Uh, they also had uh, Francisco uh, uh, Franco, uh, who took over Spain in the late 30s. Uh, he's kind of like a right-wing dictator that was kind of seen as a semi-fascist, although it's kind of debatable about whether he was fascist compared to the ones like Mussolini and Hitler were, uh, more or less. Uh, but uh, Franco was a uh, Spanish general uh, that seized control of Spain during the so-called Spanish Civil War, uh, which lasted about three years. Uh, the Spanish Civil War is an interesting war uh, because they, they think it was like a precursor uh, to like World War II. Because uh, you know what happened? The um, the Germans uh, and the Italians backed Franco's forces uh, in the war. And uh, the um, what happened was the on the other side, they had the Republican side. Like in Spain, they had the Republican side. And they had the Spanish nationalists under Franco while uh, they were fighting. And the Republicans were backed up by the communists and the anarchists, uh, along with the Soviet Union, uh, who sent in forces. I think even Americans in over here uh, that were kind of communists or whatever supported it uh, as well against Franco. Uh, and um, what ended up happening was the Spanish nationalists eventually, they won, they won the war. Uh, and the so-called Francoists took over. They took out Franco of Spain, I think they usually dub it, uh, which was like a semi-fascist state that's around like the 1970s, believe it or not. But Franco, uh, had, he supported Hitler, you know, and supported Mussolini, uh, those two powers. But when World War II broke out, he didn't get involved in the war. He kind of stayed neutral uh, and all that. Franco lived till 1975, believe it or not. So you had some fascists that kind of survived, you know, later. Think of uh, Latin America, like in, I want to say it was at Chile or one of those countries. They've got fascists, you know, running to Argentina. They've got fascist leaders uh, also as well that survived after the war that are kind of around. Uh, Japan had fascist rulers like uh, Hideki Tojo, who was prime minister at one point, was kind of somewhat fascist, I think, as, as well. But, uh, of course, the one we'll talk about the most uh, is Benito Mussolini. He's, you know, considered to be really, you know, one of the most, you know, first big fascists that really comes out, uh, of course, and takes over. Uh, uh, Mussolini was the fascist dictator of Italy, the Kingdom of Italy. He was prime minister from 1922 uh, to 1943. Uh, Mussolini, by the way, was an ex-veteran of World War I. So was Adolf Hitler uh, as well. He fought in the war. Uh, and uh, Mus uh, Mussolini uh, did, did different things. Uh, he was a former school teacher. I think he was an editor of a newspaper. He did different things. And they actually think that Mussolini was a socialist originally, believe it or not, uh, when he switched to the fascist side. And he formed this political party called the Nationalist Fascist Party called the PNF. And what they were famous for, if you know about it, was uh, Mussolini decided that he needed a symbol. Uh, and so he adopted what they call the fasci, the so-called Roman symbol that went back to ancient times. Uh, the fasci was a symbol of Roman authority. Uh, it's like a bundle of uh, sticks or rods with an ax coming out of it. I think the word fasci means bundle or bundle of rods, some people say as well. Uh, and so he would take this and kind of incorporate it into his movement. He put it on flags, buildings, and things like that. And so uh, what Mussolini was trying to do uh, was he was trying to kind of revitalize Italy. He was trying to he was trying he was trying to create this modern Italy uh, that would be like the Roman Empire, which would control most of the Mediterranean region in North Africa. Uh, and so. Later on, when he came to power, if you know about it, he would go and try to take over Africa. He like, took over like Libya. He took over Abyssinia, uh, which is like where Ethiopia is. And I think during World War II, he allied with Hitler and Nazi Germany, tried to invade Albania, Greece, uh, and all that. Uh, so he had all these great ambitions that, that he wanted to do. But Mussolini was really a weaker fascist compared to, say, Adolf Hitler 
Uh, he was later in power in Germany. Uh, he was famous for forming this uh, paramilitary force called the Black Shirts, which were mostly composed of ex-veterans of World War I. They would kind of march around with these black uniforms on uh, and, uh, I guess, beat anybody up that wasn't like a fascist. And it helped, they helped Mussolini seize power uh, over time. Uh, and um, here's some more pictures of Mussolini right here, the fasci. But uh, they had this thing uh, in 1922 uh, known as the March on Rome, uh, where he and his uh, fascists in black shirts uh, had this mass demonstration uh, that occurred on October 22nd to the 29th. It happened over a period of like a week. And uh, what happened was in Italy, there was this uh, issue where uh, it looked like a civil war was going to break out. Uh, and uh, so um, the king the king of Italy was concerned. Uh, you had two sides. You had the communists on one side. You wanted to seize control of the country. And then you had the fascists as well. So you had both these sides uh, that were there. So they did this de mass demonstration where they marched on Rome. Uh, I think it had 30,000 men or so. Uh, they were kind of involved in it. And eventually what occurred was the um, prime minister eventually appointed Mussolini. He appointed him uh, prime minister of the country uh, in 1922. And so uh, within so many years after that, I think within like a couple of years after that, what occurred was Mussolini then set himself up uh, as um, with a title. He started calling himself the Il Duce, uh, which is a title which meant, by the way, it actually means the Duke is what it means in Italian. But also some people, I think it translates also, if you look at Italian, it means also the leader is what Duke actually means. So the leader or the Duke is what it means. And um, what happened was, uh, I think when he first came to power, he was kind of like this politician wearing like suits or whatever. But within a few years, he starts wearing military uniforms. Uh, and so all these other fascists kind of start copying Mussolini. They start wearing, you know, military uniforms like they're like a general slash, you know, politician. Uh, and so that's what you kind of get, these militarized type political leaders, uh, which were fascists. So, uh, and so, yeah, Adolf Hitler was like, you know, heavily influenced uh, by Mussolini. I think there's a story where uh, Hitler sent actually a picture of Mussolini to him to get autographed because he was, he was kind of his idol. Uh, and Mussolini sent the picture back to him unsigned saying, who are you? <laughs> and I think mostly did like him at first, but they kind of became friends later. So, all right. Then, of course, we're going to move on, of course, and talk about, of course, the other famous fascist that's well known, of course, which is Adolf Hitler, of course, who comes to power. Eventually, you can see uh, right there. Uh, yeah, Hitler, of course, would become chancellor of Germany in 1933. He, as you know, helped develop the so-called Nazi Party. Uh, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, also called for short NSDAP. Uh, and a little background about Adolf Hitler. They kind of went through that in the video, but he was actually not from Germany. He was from Austria. He was born, of course, 1889. Of course, today is Adolf Hitler's birthday. I think he's 132 years old. Yes. Uh, and um, anyway, um, oh, looks like we've got a few... Um, other people online. It looks like, hey, what's up, Jimmy Moffitt? Hey, what's going on? We got Nelly. Looks also online. I'll just kind of mention that all the way. Stalin, you're talking about? Stalin was a uh, communist, of course, not a fascist. Yeah, that's true. But anyway, um, so Hitler, yeah, was from Austria, born there. I think in Linz, which is like in northern Austria originally. Uh, so I was a customs, I think. Um, official or something like that with the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire. And um, as you know, he uh, flunked out of high school. He didn't finish high school. That's why he. That's why Hitler struggled. So if you don't finish high school, go to college, you know, that, that's what ends up happening. You become a bum. <laughs> that's what occurred. Hitler, yeah, kind of was a bum later uh, in Vienna. Uh, he wanted to go to art school, but of course couldn't get into art school either. And then World War I broke out. Uh, as well. Uh, and that's what kind of, I think, made Hitler was World War I. Uh, he did become a war hero. That's something that is true, uh, even though he only reached, I think, the rank of Lance Corporal. Uh, but he actually was known for bravery uh, in the war. 
he was actually gassed at one point, like from poison gas, and was blinded uh, at the end end of the war. And after the after the war ended, uh, Hitler kind of felt like Germany was betrayed uh, by various people in in Germany, including I think he blamed a lot of Jews for it. Hitler hated Jews, I think, going back to Vienna. Uh, and uh, anyway, what happened was in 1919, he joined this political party uh, in Munich, Bavaria, which was called the German Workers' Party. That was the original name of it. It's kind of like a middle-class type work workers' party. And what happened was by 1921, he became the main leader of it and changed his name. It became known as the National Socialist German Workers' Party, which all, all the enemies of it called it Nazi for short, hence the name uh, it was called. You can see it was around active for about 1920 to about 1945. Uh, and um, they called it National Socialist because uh, the fact, I think early on in the party in the 20s, they kind of embraced some socialism uh, into the party because socialism was real popular in Europe. They thought that might, might get people to join it uh, more or less. But I think by the 1930s, they kind of went, they went away from that. It became more anti-Marxist, which it was known for. They thought they needed capitalists to come, like business people to come in, you know, because they needed money uh, to, I guess, have Hitler in power and all that. Uh, but the Nazis were very anti Semitic. They hated Jews, like Slavic type peoples. They hated communism. Uh, they talk about the master race, you know, the fact that the Germans were like the Aryan race and things like that. So you get all these pseudo science ideas that kind of the Nazis start pushing that they were kind of known for, of course, later. Uh, the Nazis, of course, are famous for the swastika. Of course, they saw, of course, in the video uh, as well. That became the symbol of party by 1920. Uh, they think Hitler did adopt it, by the way, uh, which you can see it had a red background to it uh, with white and black. Uh, and uh, those are like colors they kind of incorporate into the German flag uh, overall. They call it different names. I think the original name they call it is the Hockenkreuz, which means the hook cross. So it's a type of cross uh, they think that came from Christianity, although they think the actual swastika is something that originated from the Far East, like in India. Like all your Indian religions, you know, they have, they use that symbol, like in Hinduism and Buddhism, uh, et cetera. Uh, but he would incorporate, and he also incorporated it with other symbols. As, as you know, what they did was they took it and they, they used like the iron cross with it also as well. Uh, they also used like the eagle, which the eagle was a Roman symbol, you know. And, uh, you know, I think like the, you know, about the, about the, you know, Mussolini, like the Mussolini fascists and the Nazi fascists, they use like the different salute, like the, they got, I think they got the fascist salute was like this and then the, you know, the other one, like the Nazi was like straightforward and all that. So they got these different salutes. So I guess went back to the Roman times because they say that Roman emperors would give a salute or something like that. And that's kind of the origin of maybe where that came from, from a long time ago. There's some Roman influences there, obviously, that are kind of going on. Uh, later, uh, when uh, Hitler would get more powerful, like especially when the Third Reich would come in, uh, there would be very famous leaders that were under him. Uh, they, there's really two men, I think they say, that were the most powerful uh, that were under Hitler. They had Hermann Goering, you may have heard of, who was later the head of the uh, what they call the, the uh, Nazi Germany's Air Force, called the Luftwaffe. So he, he was kind of considered almost like second in command uh, to Hitler. Uh, he was the head of the, he, he actually first headed up the Gestapo, which he founded which was the what they call the uh, Nazi Germany's a secret police, kind of like the version of the Nazis, kind of similar to the Soviets, like KGB or NKVD, kind of like that. Uh, and then also Goering was the one that created the so-called first concentration camps, the KZs uh, throughout Germany, where they put people in those camps that were kind of against the regime, like the cow and all that. Uh, yeah, Dachau. Um uh, also, Himmler is kind of a debate about which one was more powerful, Himmler uh, or Hermann Goering. Uh, Himmler, Heinrich Himmler, you know, was uh, the head of the Gestapo, like the main one eventually throughout, especially up to the, through World War II. Uh, he added that. And then he also headed up what they call the SS, which was called the Schutzstaffel, uh, which meant pr protection squad. I think squadron is kind of what it meant 
they're called the so-called black shirts because they would wear these black uniforms. And uh, they were known for these um, caps that had, if you know about it, had these skull and crossbones that were on the top. They're kind of scary. Uh, and um, the SS was primarily a paramilitary force uh, is what it was uh, that dealt with like internal security. That's mostly what they were known for. And uh, they're kind of famous, if you know it, but the SS were the ones that ran the concentration and death camps uh, in World War II uh, when the Nazis committed a lot of genocide, uh, which, which you saw over 10 million were probably killed by them at one point. Hitler killed a lot of people, kind of like Stalin did, including 6 million Jews. Uh, and so, yeah, they were kind of known for implementing the Holocaust uh, in, in Europe. Uh, they also had the Waffen SS, you may have heard of too, uh, which were these uh, elite soldiers of Hitler, uh, which were, I think, all blonde or blue-eyed or something like that. A lot, in fact, I think it was some of the requirements. You had to have blonde hair, blue eyes, or something like that to be in the SS. <laughs> so things like that. That was considered like a perfect area. And even though Hitler had black hair and blue eyes, I think. So anyway. Uh, also, Ernest Rahm was another guy. He was pretty powerful up to like the early 30s. If you study about Rahm, uh, he was, I think, in the Nazi party early on with Hitler. Uh, he was head of the SA, uh, which is called the Brown Church, uh, which you can see, which stood for Sturm Abteilung, which meant the Storm Detachment or Storm Division. And it was another paramilitary force uh, that was uh, under Hitler. It's actually one of the first he formed. And uh, it was like Hitler's bodyguards. They actually protected Hitler from the beginning, like at his rallies when he would give speeches uh, and um at one point by 1934, they had 3 million men uh, that were in uh, the SA. And Rom, Rom could have like rivaled Hitler. I think it was a case where, you know, he could have led Nazi Germany too uh, as well. But Hitler had him killed off so he could, you know, maintain total power uh, and all that. Later, the SA was, I think, was merged with the German army or, S or SS, like in third 1934. Uh, they, asked that, they also had Joseph Goebbels. You may have heard of him. He was head of like propaganda under Hitler. He controlled a lot of the news media, radio, music, movies, uh, things like that. And uh, Goebbels was kind of important in using a lot of propaganda to control the population and brainwash people. Uh, you know, that's part of why they were able to kill the Jews off because uh, they, they kind of, you know, compared you know, the, the Jews, like they were vermin, like they would show video of like the Jews being like, you know, roaches or, or rats and things like that. And that really got people brainwashed, you know, in general into thinking it, you know, more or less. So, uh, oh, and then they have Martin Bormann. Yeah, I'll kind of mention him for later, but Bormann, Bormann was pretty powerful too. He was Hitler's pretty much private secretary, probably one of the closest men to Hitler especially up to the 1940s, near the end when he died. And he was actually the so-called chief of the Nazi party chancellor. He ran the chancellery building uh, later when Hitler's in power and all that. And so Bormann, Bormann, I think they think may have died with Hitler in the bunker, but I think some people think he may have escaped after the war, but they're not sure about that. Let's also talk about Hitler's rise to power, of course, which occurs uh, eventually uh, Hitler is eventually going to attempt to try to seize power. He tries to do it early on. I think Hitler thought that he might be able to seize power like Mussolini did. So if you know what happened was 1923, he attempted what became known as the Beer Hall Push, where Nazis tried to seize uh, what is the uh, actual government in Bavaria. This happened in Munich, Munich, Bavaria, where about 3,000 Nazis tried to storm the government buildings there, uh, but the Munich police came out and squashed it, stopped it. Uh, I think 16 Nazis were actually killed uh, in, 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 that, in that coup attempt. Uh, and it um, happened on November 9th, 1923. And so Hitler was arrested. Uh, he was accused of treason. Uh, but uh, what happened was at his trial, there was some kind of sympathetic judge uh, who didn't really like uh, the... Weimar government. Uh, and so he gave him a sentence of only like five years. 
he was only a yeah, five-year sentence, but Heller ended up, by the way, uh, he only served like nine months in prison, like in 1924. And uh, what happened was Hitler, when he was in prison, ended up writing a book called Mein Kampf, which I'm sure you've heard of, which was dictated by one of his uh, deputy Führers named Rudolf Hess. Uh, and uh, Mein Kampf meant, by the way, in German, my battle or my struggle. And um, that wasn't the original name of the book. I think he was going to call it originally uh, Four and a Half Years of Struggle Against Lies, Stupidity, and Cowardice. It's kind of a mouthful. Uh, and so he was kind of talked into a shorter version of that. And um, it became a very popular book in, in Germany. A lot of people read it, uh, and it helped to kind of, I think, get Hitler in power, make it more popular. Uh, I think also it helped, helped him with the royalties to survive later in the 20s because it was kind of a struggle early on with the Nazism. But um, Mein Kampf was also important, too, because it outlined, like, the Nazi cause, like what the Nazis were going to do when they seized power. And he was also considered autobiography, kind of talked about his life going back to when he was a child and his struggles in life up through World War I. Uh, and um, the book talks talks about a lot of different ideas. I and mean, it talks about, you know, uh, the Germans should be the master race, uh, things like that. It talks about the fact that the weaker races like the Slavs, the Jews, he thought they needed to be eliminated, uh, get rid of communism or something else uh, that he wanted. He talked about the idea of seeking revenge against the Treaty of Versailles. That was one thing that he talks a lot about in a lot of his speeches, you know, that. He also talked about this other idea called Lebensraum, uh, which I'll put on the screen for you, which was the idea of living space. <clears throat> and um, he thought that Germany needed, you know, continuous space, space to expand uh, as a power. And so he saw that in Eastern Europe as a possibility where Germany could expand eastward, colonize it, uh, and all of that. And so that's something that he that does happen <clears throat> later. He also he also talks about Anschluss too. Uh, Anschluss was this idea uh, where uh, Germany would be joined with Austria. He thought Austria should be part of the, this this you know Germany that he wanted to envision later uh, as a whole. So he had all these kind of new ideas uh, that that became something that actually happened uh, later in. Very few people, by the way, read Mein Kampf outside of Germany. Very few people knew about it. Uh, I think Winston Churchill may have read it or something like that and thought, oh, my God, this guy's crazy. But nobody knew about this, of course. I think at one point when Hitler came to power, Time Magazine Time Magazine had him as man of the year. Do you know that? Nobody thought he would be that bad. So anyway, um, of course, there's um, – Paul von Hindenburg, uh, which you see there, he would help, of course, Hitler get into power, uh, as you know. Well, Hitler, you know, he would seize power. Part of why Hitler came to power, if you know about this uh, more or less, was that they had the so-called stock market crash in the United States uh, where our economy crashed here. Uh, and so it reverberated everywhere, of course, across you know Europe and Latin America, Asia, uh, they had massive unemployment where people's economies crashed and all that. So that, you know, led to the rise of fascism in different countries. And you can see Germany had massive unemployment. Uh, 1932, I think, was the peak of it. About 6 million, year, 6 million people unemployed. And so because of bad economic times, people started to listen to Hitler and what he was, of course, talking about. And um, so Hitler, what happened was in 1932, he ran for president against Paul von Hindenburg, uh, who you can see who had been president since 1925. Uh, you can see he was a famous ex-veteran of World War I, famous general. Uh, there's Hitler with um, uh, Hindenburg right there in the top picture there. And um of course, Hindenburg's famous for the Zeppelin named after him. You've ever heard of the, you know, the Zeppelin named Hindenburg, right? Uh, that actually blew up uh, in New Jersey. Uh, it's where uh, Led Zeppelin got its first uh, album cover. You see, ever seen the first album of Led Zeppelin? 
they got the picture of the Hindenburg blowing up. That's where it came from. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, yeah, he ran into a buzzsaw. Though Hindenburg was really popular, you know, at the time, and people thought he was like committing suicide uh, by running against him. Uh, but uh, what happened was the uh, Nazis did very well uh, in in the elections. Uh, and so um, what happened was because of the fact that, you know, Hitler, Hitler and the Nazis were able to get so many votes uh, in the German parliament uh, that it eventually forced Hindenburg in 1933 uh, to appoint Hitler chancellor. So that's what happened. 1933, Hitler comes to power in January, January 30th uh, is when he became chancellor of Germany. And so a lot of historians think that when that occurs, that's basically the beginning of what we call Nazi Germany or what Hitler called later the Third Reich is what they called it because the Nazis and Hitler talked about this idea that they would control Germany for a thousand years, another thousand year Reich uh, and all that. Yeah, I guess it's good good comparison. Yeah, you got a lot of people unemployed back then, and so that's that's the kind of things that happen sometimes. You have radical people that try to take over when when things are bad. You know that that does happen sometimes, of course. But um, anyway, um, now how did Hitler go? For, he came to power via democracy. That's one thing that's interesting about it. Kind of like kind of like other people do, uh, more or less in power. But what happened was, if you study what, what occurred, as soon as Hitler took over, he started putting all the Nazis in the government, like controlling controlling the government, controlling the military. Uh, and so what ends up happening within it, like a year or something like that, uh, he creates a totalitarian state is what occurs. Like from actually from 1933 to 1934, like within one year, uh, it goes from being this democratic state uh, to being a Nazi totalitarian state with no other political parties, it's done like real, real fast, like overnight. So, so yeah, uh, and I'll get to Hindenburg. He dies of natural causes of old age in 1934, and that opens for pretty much Hitler to take total power, you know, in Germany in 34. But there were some things that actually caused Hitler to really gain a lot of power, if you know about this. There was an incident that happened in February of 1933 called the Reichstag fire. And uh, there was a this uh, I think it was a Dutch communist named Marinus van der Lubbe burned down the German Parliament building, which is the so-called Reichstag building, which was by the way not used for many years until they rebuilt it. Uh, and yeah, actually they think he did burn it down. I think it's been kind of a debate. I think it was a theory that the Nazis did it or something like that. But I think they know they know now that he did burn it, uh, and they think that uh, Marinus van der Lubbe was trying to incite some kind of revolution against the Nazis, uh, try to, you know, overthrow them, uh, basically. And so what happened was the uh, Hitler and the Nazis took advantage of it, and they passed these two things. They had the so-called Reichstag fire decree, and they also had the Enabling Act that came out in March of 1933. Uh, what were those? Uh, they did two different things. Uh, the Reichstag fire decree, what it did was it banned all political parties except the Nazi party. So the only party you could join politically was the Nazis. That's it. <clears throat> so eliminates all parties, communists, whatever. Enabling Act, what it did was it gave Hitler uh, totalitarian powers as a dictator. So it made him a dictator, what it did. <clears throat> and Hitler could actually create laws. He could actually create law, like decrees or laws uh, for the state. And that led later to the Nuremberg Laws, if you know about that, in 1935, uh, which basically took citizens' right, citizenship rights from Jews, uh, took, took that away. Because, you know, after that, they start the Holocaust, and they start persecuting the Jews uh, in Nazi Germany. So the Holocaust starts like in 1935, uh, early on uh, in all that. Uh, like I said, Hindenburg would die in 1934, uh, and so what happened was Hitler basically took the chancellorship and the presidency and he merged them together uh, into a new position called the, the Fuhrer, the leader, uh, basically, uh, which was done in a national plebiscite in August of 1934. Supposedly 90% of the population voted yes and 10% voted no. And... <laughs> 
I've heard stories about the people that voted. No, they got really, really killed badly. And some, some were even put into like some of the concentration camps that like, like opposed Hitler, like early on. So a lot of people were in prison and camps like Dachau, all that. Uh, if you like opposed him, et cetera. Uh, the other thing he did too, which is true. Uh, they had this thing called the, um, they call it different names. I think the common name they called it is the Night of Long Knives, but they usually call it the Rom Push or the Nazi Blood Purge, I think is sometimes what they'll kind of nickname it. Happened in June, July of 1934. And what happened was Hitler purged the Nazi party of internal enemies. And by the way, anybody that was considered more to the left was gotten rid of. So you want to like people like in the, to the right side, because they had people that kind of to the left or moderate while they were in the party. He got rid of them. And Ernest Rom, if you know about what happened with him, he had him killed. They were going to shoot him. I think he wanted to shoot himself, but he wouldn't shoot himself. And so Hitler had him shot. Uh, so he killed Ernest Rom. Rom was killed. And what they did was they took the SA, they merged the SA uh, with either the Army or the SS, uh, is what they did. And so after that, Hitler started to take total power uh, in Germany. And even, even like, um, force the uh, military, like the German armed forces, uh, which is the Wehrmacht, they all took an oath uh, to Hitler, basically like a blood oath or something like that, as they call it sometimes. So that's Hitler, you know, slowly taking over Germany uh, at that point. And so all these Nazis are going to, you know, start taking over, like fascists in Europe, Hitler and Mussolini start taking over of course, and all that, uh, which we'll get more into. I'll talk about the Axis powers and all that later. Uh, of course, this is going to form later, of course, in World War II. Now, of course, one of the first things that Hitler's going to do after he seizes power in the 1930s, he's going to start rearming Germany, uh, trying to make it into a world power. So what they did was they uh, reinstated the national draft, like conscription was brought back. Uh, they reestablished the German Navy. Uh, he built pretty much from scratch uh, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, which Hermann Goering uh, was the head of it. Goering, by the way, was a World War I uh, flying ace uh, who knew the Red Baron and all that. That's why he was kind of popular. And uh, so the, all those things, of course, were done. Uh, and so Hitler starts to defy the West and the Treaty of Versailles. They, they want to get revenge for it uh, and all that. And so you can see a bunch of things that Hitler's going to do uh, to seize power. He's going to reoccupy territory. Uh, he's going to form like alliances with other states like Italy. He'll form an alliance with Japan eventually as well. We'll get to that more later uh, about that, uh, the Axis powers. <clears throat> and um, he'll, also, um, he'll also, of course, take other territory, not just I think if you study about early on, uh, the first thing they take back are these territories. Uh, first was in 1936. They took back the Rhineland. The Rhineland was a demilitarized zone, I think I mentioned before, that was set up between France and Germany. Uh, and so Hitler, in 1936, marched in there and took it. And, of course, the Allies in the West, like France, Britain, kind of just watch. They didn't do anything to really stop Hitler. Uh, and then, of course, he would annex Austria, 1938, uh, into the Third Reich, which was later dubbed Anschluss. And then I'll get to, I'll get to the most important thing they think it helped to kind of help to lead to World War II later was, was the issue over Czechoslovakia was a big, big issue that really would lead to eventually, you know, World War II and then Poland. Poland's, of course, the big thing, you know, that really starts World War II when Hitler will, will eventually invade it in 1939. Uh, wh how, why was Hitler able to do all this? Well, well, there's different theories on this, but uh, obviously two big things. That was a major issue of why the Nazis were able to, you know, overrun Europe was really these two things. One, the, the League of Nations was really a weak entity. It didn't really have the power to really stop these fascist dictators in Europe. I think they tried embargoes and things like that, but that really didn't work. And then uh, also uh, in countries like Britain and I think France, they began to adopt a new policy 
which of course was the policy of appeasement. Uh, and they thought that was a good way to, to really prevent war where they would use diplomacy, appease other powers, uh, give in to whatever demands they needed. They thought they would just kind of go away, uh, but they, they didn't. Uh, and so um, that's what's going to lead to World War II uh, because a lot of these powers like Britain, France, really don't want to fight another world war. They lost like, you know, I don't know, they must have lost like one to two million men uh, in that war. Uh, and so they don't really want to do that. Uh, Hitler also would form an alliance, you know, which would later be called the Axis powers, which we'll, of course, get more into later. Uh, but initially uh, in 1936, he formed an alliance with Italy. Uh, they call it the Rome-Berlin Axis originally, but usually called Axis powers later. And then by 1940, Japan will join it during World War II uh, as well. And those were kind of considered part of an alliance that was called later the Tripartite Pact. You may have heard of. They kind of formed a mutual alliance with each other. And so those were considered the three main Axis powers that fought against the Allies in World War II. Although they had other countries that kind of joined it also, like Hungary, I think in Romania, were kind of in it uh, as well with Germany, but they weren't that powerful compared to those three. Germany and Japan were really the most powerful, and Italy was more of a weaker state compared to those other ones uh, that were there. Now, I want to talk about one thing that was a big, big, you know, cause of, you know, why World War I broke out. Uh, of course, I do have a list showing a lot of different causes of World War II, which, of course, we'll be talking about more later. Uh, you can see those are a lot of them. Treaty of Versailles, uh, of course, extreme nationalism, which was a big thing. You see in Na Nazi Germany, Empire of Jan Japan, Kingdom of Italy, Worldwide Depression, where I talked about that, uh, the rise of dictatorships, of course, policy of appeasement. Yeah, American isolationism didn't help either. That's something that they think helped to cause World War I uh, as well. Uh, in the United States, between World War I and World War II, didn't want to get involved in Europe's problems. We wanted to stay isolated. We had all the economic problems we had enough of, like the Great Depression, and that had a lot to do with it, why we didn't get in the war uh, early on, like in 1939. Uh, and so that's also considered, and also the fact that we didn't support the League of Nations like we should have. We didn't join it and all that, and that was another problem as well. Uh, I'll get to the non-aggression pact. I don't know if I'll talk about that today, but he has that thing with the Soviet Union, the non-aggression pact, but Probably not, but I think it was a way to uh, prevent a two-front war uh, when he attacked the French uh, in the West with Britain. Uh, and so, yeah, that's partially why he did it. Uh, but I think he knew that he eventually he would end up in a war with the Soviets anyway. So I think that's why I think it was just more like temporary because he thought that the Soviets were going to get powerful enough that they could attack him. And so he eventually thought they would have to fight a war against Bolshevism uh, and all that. But um, the big thing they talk about going into uh, World War II that helped cause it. There was an issue over Czechoslovakia in 1938, uh, which was later called the Sudetenland Crisis. Uh, and Hitler started, you know, rattling about the fact that part of Czechoslovakia used to be under Germany. Uh, and there were actually these pro-German areas. So they called them Sudeten, Sudeten Germans, I think is what he called them, basically that lived there. I want to say like 3 million maybe, they were kind of somehow descended to the Germans. And he thought they should basically uh, be part of Germany. Uh, and so it almost causes World War II uh, to break out in 1932. Uh, in fact, so bad that Britain and France worry so much that they decide to try to intervene to prevent a big another world war from breaking out. So all, all those two countries, Britain, France, met with Germany and Italy in Munich, Bavaria, and Germany. They went, went there. And they had this conference there. So it's called the Munich Conference or something like that. Usually called the Munich Pact or Munich Agreement. Uh, and um, what happened was the Western powers like Britain and I guess also France went along with it too as well, agreed to this thing called the Munich Pact or Munich Agreement where they decided that they were going to go ahead and give Hitler the Western part of Czechoslovakia, that Sudetenland area, in exchange for avoiding a war. 
because Hitler was saying that he was going to invade uh, into uh, Czechoslovakia. They didn't give it to him. Uh, and, and so um, if you know about it, there was this man named um, Neville Chamberlain. I think I've got a picture of Chamberlain, which is right here. He, of course, was one of the most famous men there uh, that was at the conference with Hitler. Uh, and um, he thought that he could trust Hitler. He was a man of his word. Uh, and so if you know what happened was he had him sign this piece of paper. You can see that he's got in his right hand saying that he wouldn't take any more land after that, that that would be his last territorial claim, I think is what he said, or something like that. And so Chamberlain came back to Brit England after that, Britain, uh, and said famously in a little speech there, uh, I think at the airport where he landed, I want to say Heathrow, I guess, in London, he said, I believe it is peace for our time, uh, is what he said, or something like that, uh, which is a very famous uh, quotation that obviously dealt with appeasement, uh, the policies of appeasement. And Neville Chamberlain was famous for that. He was famous for trying to use the policy. When you think about appeasement or other appeasements later that they have today, they still always compare it uh, to Neville Chamberlain about, about what he said basically uh, in, in that in that speech right there. Uh, and so basically they realized that, you know, Hitler, Hitler, you know, it's funny about this, but after they thought that Hitler would just be trusted or whatever. But what happened right after that uh, was that Hitler then takes the rest of Czechoslovakia. I think that you talk about it. He's going to eventually, you know, go into um, Eastern. He takes over Eastern Czechoslovakia. He takes that over. And I think he kind of creates this uh, pro-Nazi state there uh, afterwards. I forget what it was called. Slovenia, or one of those states, I think it was called, or actually Slovakia, I think is what they call it. Slovakia is what they, they actually create create there. It's kind of like a pro-Nazi state, uh, more or less. And then he starts planning to invade Poland. That's that's the big thing uh, that occurs uh, after that. Uh, and so Hitler's going to you know invade Poland after that, and that's going to, of course, lead to the outbreak of, of World, War, World War II. So here's a map kind of showing you Europe like on the eve of World War II, you can see how Nazi Germany has basically begun to, you know, take over territory in Central Europe. They've, they've taken over, you know, pretty much, you can see there, most of where Germany is today. Uh, they take over Austria. Uh, they, they take over, um, you can see that Western part of Czechoslovakia. And they're, they're kind of allied with that country I told you about, which is Slovakia, which is right here. It's kind of that Eastern part. Uh, which is where uh, Prague is. <laughs> the Nazis they butcher Prague. They kill a lot of kill a lot of the Czechs. You know about the Czechs hated the Nazis later. And you can see they overrun Poland, like the western part of it. That's what's going to lead to the outbreak of World War II. Eventually, when that happens, the Soviets will come in and take over the eastern part of Poland as well. But they stay neutral in the war. I never can't figure that out. You know exactly uh, with that, but. They didn't fight them. Uh, but what's going to happen eventually, you can see, is that when the Nazi Germany invades Poland, it's going to bring in Britain and France. They're going to, of course, declare war uh, on, on Nazi Germany. And that's what's going to ignite World War II, of course, to break out in Europe right there. So um, I probably won't get to that today, I'll probably because that's a separate lecture, of course, on World War II. But on, on, on Thursday's lecture, I'll, of course, get into uh, talking about, you know, World War II, at least part one on it. Uh, it's probably going to take two parts, probably this week and part of next week uh, to cover World War II. I know next week I'll probably have some material to kind of cover on the Cold War. It looks, doesn't look like we'll be able to cover all the Cold War like I want uh, for this, this lecture series for this semester. But um, that's going to be pretty much my lectures coming up, you know, later for this week and, of course, next week. So, uh, I guess nobody else has any more questions. I know Amber had a question about the non. I'll talk about the non-aggression pact later. Uh, that's kind of important because Hitler uses that, you know, uh, to prevent a two-front war. Because uh, you know, if he had not done that with the Soviets, if he went into Poland, you know, he might have been attacked by the Soviets and the French and the British, and that would have been like World War One all over again. So, but yeah, he reneged on it. 1941, he invaded them. Uh, started that Eastern Front, 
they think that's what pretty much killed, you know, Hitler in World War II was fighting against the Soviets, so-called Eastern Front. So that's it for today. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, about this lecture, you know, let me know uh, later uh, about it. Um, and of course, don't forget, I did have some new assignments up posted right now uh, that I've got. Uh, and so that's it for today. Y'all take care. And of course, I'll see you later in the week on Thursday. So have a great rest of the week, more or less. So Y'all take care.